Welcome, welcome everybody to the Berkman Center. What a great group we have. Uh, so Ruha is a Berkman Center fellow this year. She's also the executive director of the Internet Bar Organization, which uh, works on a number of initiatives uh, trying to improve working towards justice through technology. Um, one particular initiative that she focuses on is Peace Tones, but not, that's not what she's talking about today. She's talking about Coney 2012, which is of interest to I think a lot of different groups, which is why so many different groups are represented here. Um, so welcome, Ruha. Thanks, Amr. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm really excited about having all you guys in the room, especially invisible children people and ICC people, because um, I'm talking about both a little bit. Um, so the reason I decided to do a presentation on Coney 2012 is not because I'm an expert in it by any means, but because um, the phenomenon really, really interests me as a practitioner in the field. Um, as Amr mentioned, I run a nonprofit that does access to justice work through technology. One of our projects is um, a musician's advocacy project where we work with musicians around the world uh, trying to use social media and teaching them about social media and how to use those tools to gain exposure for their own music. Um, and the musicians we work with all have social justice messages to their music. So I think for me and for a lot of practitioners in the field, Coney 2012 is a really great example and, and a really great learning tool. So <clears throat> I'll be going through some of, the, some of the positive aspects of the campaign, some of the negatives and the, and the criticisms as well, um, but mostly, mostly to learn from them. Um, and you know, I, I think overall it's a really, really great campaign because of the impact it's had. So I, I would just like to see a, a show of hands. How many people have actually seen the Coney 2012 video? OK, good. And how many have seen some of the follow-up videos? OK. So um, and I, I will go through it a little bit, just, just for those of you who are listening in or those of you who haven't seen the video uh, or videos yet. So um, Coney 2012 came out in Mar early March of 2012. Um, and it was a video campaign created by a nonprofit called Invisible Children who focus on the, um, the conflict in, in Uganda and the surrounding countries uh, between the LRA, which the, the Lord's Resistance Army, and um, the governments of those countries. So this conflict has been going on for over two decades. Uh, it's winding down now, but it is still ongoing. The LRA still does exist. Uh, Kony is still out there. Um, and this campaign was created to bring an end to the conflict and to have Joseph Kony arrested and um, tried at the ICC. Um, he has already been indicted at the ICC, and so uh, the campaign calls for basically countries to follow up on their obligations to, to capture him and bring him to the courts so he can be tried. Um, so there, there are some main, main elements that I'll go through um, of this particular video and then after that, I'll go through some of the critiques of the video and then and the, the follow-up that Invisible Children did on those critiques. Um, one thing that really interests me and I think interests a lot of nonprofits working in, in today's day and age is how do you captivate an audience and how do you capture their attention when they are so saturated by audio, visual, textual media, um, by the news, by, by entertainment media, how do you capture their attention and bring it to something that isn't really something people want to think about. Um, people don't want to think about violence and murder and torture, and especially when it's in another country and on another continent, it's, it's even further removed from you. So how do you bring that to the attention of an audience that is, is otherwise saturated with a whole bunch of other things? Um, so invisible, invisible children's target audience is <clears throat> the millennials, which is people who were born after 1980, and I'm technically included in that category, but um, I feel like I'm aging out a little bit. Um, so it's a generation after mine, I would say. Um, and they are, they are generally portrayed as very 
media savvy, very tech savvy, but also very apathetic when it comes to uh, politics and especially world affairs. So it's an especially hard uh, age group to target when you're trying to bring attention to international human rights issues. And one uh, extremely impressive thing about the Coney 2012 video is it is currently the most viral video that was ever made. Uh, it reached a hundred million views in less than a week and it was about an issue that um, even people within, uh, even people who are international relations savvy or international affairs savvy, um, an issue that sort of dropped off our radar. So the LRA, the civil conflict in northern Uganda and, and the DRC in Sudan, um, these th I mean Sudan was in the attention of the world uh, last year and a couple years ago, but that's dropped off as well. And so Kony 2012 sought to revive attention on, on that particular issue. And the main elements of the video um, are both the strength of the campaign and the weakness. When people critique the campaign, often it's, it's these very same things that they critique. Um, one, that, that the campaign personalizes and emotionalizes an issue that is much more complex and involves many more actors, but personalizing involves bringing it down to one person or, or uh, you know, a group of people that may not really be on the ground in northern Uganda. For example, this video starts off with, um, it talks about social networks and the power of social networks and the power of us, us being young, uh, Western, middle income audiences um, based here in the U.S. mostly. They start off with um, a, a whole series of YouTube clips that have caught on, have become viral memes here in the States. For example, this one is of a 29-year-old hearing herself speak for the first time, and it's a really emotional clip. The point of putting this in the Coney 2012 video is to elicit emotion. There's elicit emotion and have you connect with the video on, on a level that has nothing to do with Uganda, has nothing to do with Joseph Kony. And, and this has been a criticism of, um, of the campaign. Um, they also did something very interesting and, and very, very personal, which is to bring into the video as a protagonist the head of the organization. So this is Jason Russell, and this is one of the most intimate moments of a person's life. His wife is giving birth to their son. And they put this, they put this scene in the video because it's one of those moments in your life that you have the most visceral, guttural reactions, and that's what they're trying to elicit. Um, and you'll notice in the video that Jason has an invisible children bracelet on. Um, you know, so if, if you are familiar with the symbolism, it ties things in. Um, the video then goes on to bring in, for the first time, Jacob, who is a Ugandan um, person who Jason met on his very first trip to Uganda. Um, and his friendship with Jacob is, is part of what um, Jason Russell cites as, as one of his main ties to the cause. And one very clever thing that they did was to tie in the social media arc, the social media narrative, with the Ugandan narrative. Now, Jason actually met Jacob in Uganda before Facebook even existed. But the way they tie it in is they go through a Facebook timeline um, animation on the video, and they scroll down the timeline sidebar down to 2003, which is before Facebook existed, um, to show the narrative of how Jason and Jacob met, which, which is a, a really clever way of integrating um, <coughs> the social media and the connectedness narrative with the Uganda narrative. And then the video goes into um, the conflict itself, but again, it goes into it on a very simple, personal level. Um, and the audience helps, is, is helped to connect with the conflict by being introduced to just one person, one child, and that child's grief. And this, 
this scene um, is extremely emotional and I think is, is, um, is extremely well done because it's very hard to give victims of conflict, uh, to personalize the grief of victims of conflict and to give it the same currency as your own grief. And in this film, I think they did a, a really, really good job of doing that. And you see Jacob talking about his brother here. And um, you can tell he doesn't do this often. He doesn't talk about it. He doesn't think about it. But he's, Jason, Jason brings it out of him, and he breaks down and weeps, and, and it's captured in the film. Um, again, uh, this could be seen as sensationalizing grief. Um, making uh, making Ugandans mon monolithic as victims. You know, these are some of the criticisms that are brought in. But I think on a basic level, the intention was not that. The intention was to create a connection, create an emotional connection. And that's the arc that you see throughout the entire video. Um, another, thing, another thing that you realize when you're watching this video is that Jason Russell and the camp and the and the organization started or came into this conflict on a very personal, uh, basic and naive level. Um, at this point in the film, uh, Jason says to Jacob, "We're going to stop them," and it's just his his immediate reaction to someone else's grief is to say, "I'll help you. I'll, I'll figure it out." I'll, I'll, I'll get you out of this. And he says later, I had no idea how, was, how I was going to do it. Um, I figured that out later. And that, again, is, you know, is seen as problematic by many, many um, critics because you have a Westerner going into an extremely complex situation and jumping into the savior role before he even knows how he's going to do it. Uh, that's, that's the criticism, but on the personal level, we all do this all the time. Uh, we jump in way, way beyond our depth and then figure it out later. And I think that, in a sense, is, is the theme of this entire thing. Um, the video is called an experiment right in the beginning. They reference the experiment uh, metaphor many times in several uh, subsequent videos as well. And you can tell that it definitely, the approach is jumping it, jumping in because of an emotional reaction and figuring it out later. So um, is that a bad thing? Is it a bad thing to simplify foreign conflict? Is it a bad thing to jump in because of an emotional reaction? Um, one critique from the blog, Wronging Rights, um, says, first, or organizations like Invisible Children not only take up resources that could be used to fund more intelligent advocacy, they take up rhetorical space that could be used to develop more intelligent advocacy. Um, I would argue that that isn't necessarily true. I think Invisible Children appears to be capturing resources and rhetorical space that used to be spent on more frivolous things, more frivolous issues. Um, and I think that because the style of, of videography they use, the, the music they use, the merchandise they use are all, um, they target a population that is otherwise uninterested in foreign affairs. It's, it's, uh, they target a population that is quite materialistic and domestic focused. A lot of the, the visuals they use, a lot of the merchandise and the music is very domestic. It's, it's very hipster. Uh, I'll just say it. <laughs> um, and it's effective. I think it captures an audience that is otherwise looking elsewhere and brings their attention to something. It does it in a simplistic way. Um, but, you know, the question is where, where do we go from there? Where do we go from that simplicity? So the calls to action in, in the first Kony video was. Um, for viewers to forward the link of the video. Um, and this, in a sense, is, is um, it, their strategy was to capitalize on the disintermediated networks of social media. So instead of going via traditional media where there are gatekeepers, um, they were attempting to build a grassroots swell through social media and social media activism. 
They also call for people to buy the Kony 2012 kit and donate money, which those two are fundraising strategies. Um, and their strategy was smart and simple, again, because buying the kit uh, involved buying buying hipster t-shirts and, and posters and stickers that are they're all pretty cool in fact um, on on the Kony 2012 action kit website the first sentence of the description is people will think you're an advocate of awesome with this official action kit so um, and, and it seems flippant, but I think it's actually uh, a really good strategy, given their target audience. Um, the, the fourth action item that the video puts out is to write to celebrities and policymakers. And this is a really interesting um, tactic that they used, because they understood that you cannot just gain momentum with disintermediated networks. You need to appeal to, to the official and offline gatekeepers and intermediaries um, in order to really establish that groundswell. So that's what they did. Um, Invisible Children reached out to many celebrities. I don't know if you can actually see them, but Oprah is on there. So is Mark Zuckerberg. Um, Bono, of course. George Clooney. And then in terms of politicians, they reached out to politicians on both sides um, of the aisle. So there's a lot of Democrats and Republicans on that, on that particular um, collage. Mm -hmm. And um, the fifth thing that they, they called people to do was to cover the night. So they integrated offline events into this online campaign. And that's, again, something that's very important, something we've seen many social media campaigns by other nonprofits fail on because they haven't integrated this online activism with an offline engagement. So Invisible Children were very smart about that. They have a history of being very good at grass grassroots activism on the ground, offline. Um, as I mentioned before, Invisible Children predates Facebook. And a lot of their activism has been offline in schools, in colleges, showing the videos, talking to people in person, getting them engaged in person. So um, releasing the Kony 2012 video and then following that video up with two subsequent videos that again called people to attend these two in-person events was very smart of them. Um, so going on to some of the critiques of the campaign. Um, the main one was that it oversimplified the conflict in Uganda and the surrounding countries. It also, another critique was that the conflict is no longer what it used to be. Uh, the video portrays the conflict in a context that existed maybe six years ago but does not exist anymore. Um, Another critique is that most of the people in the video are Western, or at, at least um, the video is very clearly targeted at a Western or audience. There's also a critique that conflict is commercialized because of the action kits and because of the appeal that, to people to buy posters and t-shirts and bracelets and that this is going to fix everything. Um, Another critique is that there's an appeal to emotions and there isn't enough thought-provoking um, content or knowledge to back those emotions up. And so there is a danger of thoughtless action uh, that could come out of this. Another main um, criticism is that the video calls for, for um, the arrest of Kony and his delivery to the ICC. Um, and the arrest is, is called for in a, in a militaristic and interventionalist way. So they, they want the U.S. Army to go in and help the Ugandan government track Kony down, um, help the Ugandan Army track Kony down and arrest him. And so for people in international development who are more uh, peace talk focused and more peace building through development focused, 
that particular action item was problematic. Um, another thing is that the video very clearly makes good guys and bad guys. And Pony is the only bad guy I talked about, really. Um, Jacob, is, Jacob is portrayed as the good guy, the, the hero of the piece, in a sense. And he's the only hero of the piece. Um, and Coney is the only villain. And this is extremely problematic because there are a lot of actors, both on, on, on the side of working for peace and on the side of the conflict, that are not talked about. Um, but again, the, one aspect of simplification is that you have to leave facts out in order to get the me message across. Um, again, the exclusion of local voices uh, uh, you know, is justified by invisible children because, because they needed to get a simplistic message out. Um, there are critiques about how they spend their money. They spend a lot of their money on um, creating these narratives, on doing video work, um, and not as much, or not as much as people think is necessary, on on the ground development work or on the ground peacekeeping work. Um, and then a final critique is. Um, the mental breakdown and public arrest of the film's director, who was also portrayed in the film, Jason, Jason Russell. So when that happened, very, a few days after the release of the video and after a lot of the public criticism started coming out, um, the traditional news media jumped on his mental breakdown and used that in, in addition to a lot of other criticisms to sort of discredit the organization as a whole. Um, But as I, as I said before, there are a lot of good things about this that we can learn from. Um, the campaign did uh, increase the visibility of an un otherwise invisible conflict um, with an otherwise myopic audience. Um, it also provides a model for other, other human rights and humanitarian campaigns looking to do similar things. And uh, invisible children themselves, I think, learned a lot from this particular campaign and from the criticism, which is, is hugely to their credit, because a lot of organizations just crumble under such criticism. So in terms of visibility, I don't know if you can see these figures, but they're extremely impressive. Um, again, for a conflict, for an international conflict with a domestic audience, an, a, an American domestic audience, this is very, very difficult to do. Um, five million tweets on the video the week that it was released, uh, over 100 million views of the video. Um, over 13,000% increase in the views of the Invisible Children website. Um, and then on the right side of this infographic, you see um, you know, figures on the state of affairs prior to the video. So four out of five LRA um, attacks aren't reported um, by any Western news source. And this isn't surprising. There's a lot of news coming out of the entire world, a lot of conflict, and very, very little of it filters into Western media, and especially little filters into American media. American media is very domestic focused compared to even European and other Western uh, media sources. So there was a huge increase of visibility of this particular conflict. Here's more figures on, on that. Um, I think you can read this. Yep. So you got a lot of figures here showing the increase in visibility for mm -hmm. that particular video and that particular organization. Mm -hmm. And one thing that would be really interesting to look at in order to see if those criticisms are grounded or not would be the spillover effect on other secondary sources that provide accurate and thorough information about that conflict that could experience a surge in traffic due to that. And this, this is what we actually care about. Yeah. Right? So do you Absolutely. have any sense? Or has anybody looked at this? Are there? I don't know if anyone's looked at it, but that's a really interesting question. And I, I think, um, 
one one critique of the video that I think is very valid is there wasn't enough of a gateway to these other sources from invisible children. So um, it's understandable that they cannot be experts in everything. They, they, they cannot do the research on the ground, but there are people that are doing the, the research. So Human Rights Watch um, has done, um, has written many, many reports on the conflict on the ground, detailed reports that can easily be linked to from the Invisible Children website. Um, Amnesty International has, has worked on this campaign on, on the LRA issue for a while. They've even put out a few, ish, uh, a few videos on the LRA issue, um, mm -hmm. interviewed people on the ground in these communities calling for the ICC to arrest and try Kony. So it's not just invisible children um, that are turning to this ICC solution. Many people on the ground in Uganda and in surrounding countries look to the ICC as, as one of the main legitimate ways of resolving um, the conflict and bringing a sense of justice to the community. Um, but there, the, the campaign stood in isolation when it could have been integrated more, which is not to say that it cannot still do that. Um, but that's a really good point. Um, another set of, and these are all from the Invisible Children website, and these are recent. Um, this didn't, didn't exist on the website when the campaign came out. These, these are updates to the website um, showing the progress of the of the campaign after the videos come out and after subsequent videos have come out. So a lot of political action has been taken. You can see there were a few uh, political events, Move DC, which happened in November, and Lobby DC, where um, invisible children rallied people to go to Capitol Hill and lobby with, the, with their senators and Congress people to have the US um, fulfill its obligations or its promises with regard to, to Uganda. And they also have put, they, Invisible Ch Children has posted on their website um, information on their programs on the ground, which was lacking in the original Kony 2012 video, information on how much work they actually do do on the ground in terms of um, high frequency radio stations that they're building all over remote areas of um, the DRC, Central African Republic, uh, Sudan, Uganda, so that people who are at threat or at risk mm -hmm. of having the LRA attack can communicate with each other and can warn each other early. Um, invisible children also build schools and, and build um, fair trade um, work environments for people in these communities to give them alternative sources of income and help them establish them, you know, um, themselves economically. So. They do do a lot of development work and a lot of conflict prevention work that wasn't addressed in the, in the movie. And here are the four areas in which invisible children themselves work. Again, most of their money and most of their attention is spent on media and mobilization, which is not necessarily a bad thing because if you look at um, any other nonprofit, they have a specialization and they do what they're good at and there's nothing wrong with that in my opinion. Um, one, m maybe one critique that I have is that invisible children doesn't just stand up and say this is what we're good at and just allow us to do what we're good at. Um, so those are the four areas in, in which they work. So one of the responses was as I said before Jason Russell's mental breakdown and it's not surprising to me um, that he that he had an emotional breakdown because he was so emotionally tied not only to the cause but also to the video and um, not, not only was he emotionally tied but he was in the video some of the most intimate moments of his life were in the video and so the criticism of the video um, and of the campaign came down hard not only on his organization but on him as a human being as a person um, and surprisingly a lot of people had a, a huge problem with him 
with his son being in the video, with the fact that there was a cute little blonde boy in the video uh, representing this good evil dichotomy dialogue. Um, so that, you know, is understandably difficult for someone to have to deal with. Um, and the organization as a whole suffered a lot after his breakdown in terms of losing supporters. Um, so they had to recover from that. And one of the ways in which they did that was to release a series of follow-up videos. Um, Move, I think, was the, no, Kony 2012 Part 2 was the first follow-up video and um, addressed more of the context of the conflict, addressed, uh, included more Ugandan voices speaking up and saying this is also what we want. It's not just what this outside American organization is coming and telling us we need. Um, in this, in Kony 2012 Part 2, there's also a discussion of uh, international legal obligations of states, and this is the first time that comes into play. Uh, there's, there's a reference to the responsibility to protect commitment by world nations that was signed in 2005, um, which basically references an obligation that all of a, a bunch of states signed on to recognizing um, the rights of uh, hum a certain set of human rights, including the rights of children not to be recruited as child soldiers. So um, this video references that particular commitment and also recognizes that states often don't act on their promises in the in international arena. They make promises and it's very hard to hold them to them. The only way you can do that is by huge domestic pressure. Um, or by foreign policy interests like economic, political, or uh, other kinds of pressure from other states. So in terms of the United States, it's very difficult to exert foreign pressure on the U.S. And so that pressure has to come internally, which is sort of the, the point of this movie. Um, MOVE, which was released in October 2012, um, and I would really encourage everyone to watch this because it, it goes through the motivations of invisible children in making the Coney 12 video. Um, Jason Russell also addresses his breakdown, um, and, and there, there's a lot of addressing of that particular aspect of, um, of the entire situation in MOVE. And then Year in Review, uh, which is the third movie I have up here, is a, is a short one. The other two are 19 minutes and, and 30 minutes. Again, your review is about five minutes long. It's pretty short, but goes through step by step um, all of the statistics that I showed you in previous slides. Um, so, you know, I think in, in their follow-up videos, they did a really good job of bringing in more context, more nuance, more voices. All of most of the criticisms that were leveled against invisible children they addressed in those videos pretty well. Um, they've also added more context to their website. So on their website, you now have a list of 10 points that invisible children believes um, it will take to end the LRA conflict. They also have um, infographics that go into more detail on what they believe is needed. Um, the action they call for is now multinational as well, and this this builds on in part on a conference that they held in November um, in Washington D.C., where they managed to bring in bring together some very high level politicians from around the world, from Uganda, uh, the DRC, and Sudan, and have them meet together and commit to uh, bringing Kony in and ending the conflict. So. Um, Invisible Children has taken a much more multinational approach as well because, uh, in a sense, because they can now leverage their, their visibility, uh, which they could not do before. So in terms of uh, what we as, as other practitioners in the field can learn from this particular campaign, I do think it's important to personalize and emotionalize video campaigns. You have to be able to um, help your audience connect with your target community and sometimes that does involve uh, simplifying your message, simplifying the content, 
But as Jerome brought up, it's extremely important to create gateways so that you can take someone who's drawn in by an emotional connection and lead them through um, to a more nuanced and, and contextual understanding of the issue. Um, another really interesting thing that Invisible Children did that I didn't address before, and this is something that the marketing community has learned about viral videos, is a way to keep people's attention, and, and this is a long video for, for a viral video, it's 30 minutes long. A way to keep, keep people's attention is to pulse positive um, messaging with tragic or emergency messaging. If you have too much of one thing, people lose interest. And so um, in Coney 2012, they did a really good job of that. In the beginning, you have this euphoric, we are the new generation of social media and we can change the world. And then you have the, um, the tragic issues in the middle of the video uh, where you see Jacob and you see his grief and then you see Coney and you see the brutality of his, of his actions. And then they quickly bring in a positive emotion again because they don't want to lose you in that despair. So it's, um, it's actually something that works pretty well, something that worked very well in that video and um, Invisible Children has continued to do that in their subsequent videos as well. Uh, again, integrating old school mainstream um, media is still essential if you want to take your, your online campaigns and, and uh, bring them offline. Um, integrating offline events and physical ties to the cause, that's merchandising and, and the cover of the night and the, and the events on the ground is, is also extremely uh, important. Um, time sensitivity, I didn't address this before, but one thing about the Coney 2012 video is that they bring a sense of urgency to the video. They say 2012 is the year we're going to get Coney. This video is 27 minutes long and there's a countdown in the video, there's a countdown to the end of the year, and it makes you feel a sense of urgency, but you don't really know why 2012 is the year. Why is it an emergency this year, well, last year? Um, in the MOVE video, they address that, and Invisible Children say, it wasn't really an external emergency, it was an internal one within their organization. They felt a sense that, um, they were running out of steam, and this was a last-ditch effort, all chips in, we're going to go all or nothing. So it's a very interesting case where they took an internal sense of emergency and externalized it, uh, and it's, it seemed to work. People, not many people asked the question, why 2012? What, what is it about this year that Coney must be caught? Um, so, um, Another thing that I think Invisible Children learned from and, and will integrate in the future is that they need to stay more relevant to needs on the ground. If the issue that you're dealing with is six years old, um, pivot and, and talk about the issue on the ground now. People are st still being captured. It's not 30,000 child, child soldiers anymore, but 280 people captured in the past year is still a lot. Um, so. Um, I think they've, they've learned that as well. And, um, and the integration of easy calls to action um, is something very, very important. Clicktivism is, is a criticism that people have leveled against Coney 2012, but they integrated a lot of offline events and activities that I think um, take them beyond beyond that criticism and beyond what a lot of other nonprofits trying to do online campaigns haven't been able to achieve. So I'd like to open it up to discussion now because I think there's, it, it is a very controversial campaign, very controversial issue, and I'd like some of those controversies to be brought up so we can, we can discuss. Go ahead. Um, so one thing that I think Jason Russell's mental breakdown was <clears throat> something that was seized upon by critics um, and something that I think was devastating to the invisible children because you no longer have to engage with the substance of the issue. You can just say, oh, well, Jason Russell's great. <coughs> um, but I would level the same criticism inversely against invisible children with their video move. I mean, if I recall correctly, 
a lot, as you mentioned, a lot of move has to do with Jason Russell's breakdown. And something that I am concerned about is that they actually try to reframe the criticism as being not about substance, but be about being about Jason Russell's breakdown, so that once they answered that question, they didn't have to answer the more substantive criticism. Um, and I mean, another example within the move is you had, you know, I remember when they showed a bunch of YouTube criti critical responses, and one person said, well, this is the Illuminati, right? And it's meant to be somewhat joking, but it's also meant to reframe the criticism so that we have an understanding that it's more of a knee-jerk reaction to the move, uh, to the organization mm -hmm. than to, um, than to you know, their actual actions. Um, maybe this is a bit of a question with the period, um, but I was wondering if, you know, if you think that's fair or if, if you know, MOVE as a video did a better job uh, of getting to the actual substantive criticisms, um, or was it just reframing? I don't think it did a better job of getting to the substance. I think it was <clears throat> it was a reactionary video, um, and it, it was in response to um, the fallout of the initial video. And so, one of the things that they had to address, they felt they had to. They Invisible Children released a video in April after Jason Russell had already had his breakdown, and they did not address his breakdown in that video. Uh, they were trying to be, bring people back to the actual substantive issues. Um, and that didn't really work. Um, the Cover the Night event was three days after Coney 2012 Part 2 was released. And sort of they, you know, did not have the reaction they were hoping to have, did not have the kinds of on-the-street advocacy, even though all of their action kits had sold out. So hundreds of thousands of people had, had bought, had spent $30 on a kit to go out and canvas their neighborhoods, but for some reason did not go out and canvas. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons that Invisible Children probably thought affected that was his mental breakdown and the fact that they did not address it. So um, I think MOVE was, was an attempt to deal with that. And it's very interesting to see them try and walk the line between addressing every single criticism, include, including financial criticisms, um, this very personal breakdown, which had unfortunately had a very public um, aspect to it. Um, and then the fact that attention was diverted totally away from the actual cause to the organization and its founder. So. That's an answer with a question mark at the end. <laughs> um, considering that a good portion of 2012's viewers were around in their teens, mid 20s, um, wouldn't you say that, um, considering with Jason Russell's breakdown, that a good number of them didn't know about it and really couldn't really, wouldn't go out canvassing because of that? You know, everybody saw Could it. Could you repeat that? Yeah. With, um, but just so, the last part. Yeah, so with considering that a lot of young people n don't necessarily know about Jason Russell's breakdown, could that, what, what, what would be some other reasons why they didn't go out canvassing and use those toolkits? Was I it that wide? I don't remember yeah. if it I think was that widespread. That video. Video. <laughs> I think they did know. It was arguably more in the news than the original campaign because it was just so sensational. He was running around naked in the streets. You know, it's, perf it's perfect news fodder. Um, so I would argue that, that they did know. Yep. Oh, this can't. I might be one of the few people who heard a lot about the campaign and then did not know, did not know until you mentioned it that what had happened afterward. But um, OK, it's now 2013. Coney is presumably still at large. There hasn't been a U.S. military intervention. So how does, if they didn't succeed in those two goals in 2012, mm -hmm. how do they stay relevant in 2013 and keep keep people focused on it when there was so much energy put into this? This was supposed to happen last year. That's a really good question, and that's the risk you run when you put a deadline on your campaign. Um, they went all out in 2012. They said this is the end, and now, the now it's 20, 
13 and their Kony 2012 t-shirts are on sale for $10 because <laughs> um, I don't know if I have the answer to that. I don't know how you recover from that. Have they gotten any closer to a deal? If I recall, they, they were trying to get a U.S. Inter military intervention to occur. I don't think they got anywhere, anywhere close to that goal. No, but one of their, some of their other goals, uh, one was fundraising, and they were very successful at that in 2012 because of this campaign. And another was to use those funds to do more of the on-the-ground on work that they're currently doing. So to build more radio stations, to build more schools, uh, to build, help more small businesses and, and give out more scholarships. And so I think in those senses, they have been successful in terms of capturing this one individual, no, and I don't know. Um, I don't know how successful they're going to be on that particular action item. I think she was the yeah, first. maybe you reply to that. I think in the end, the whole. I mean, what was said about the end of the campaign is a bit unfair on invisible mm -hmm. children. I mean, I have my reserves on on the whole thing, but. It wasn't so unsuccessful. The thing I, I think one of the mistakes was identifying, you know, that, that by 2012 we we have to get Kony captured, which didn't happen. But if you ask Africans and Ugandans, and they say Kony's out of all those countries, he's out of Central Africa, he's uh, hidden somewhere, he's got almost nobody. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't captured because obviously he, he had a lot of, but he's out of the picture completely. So. But the problem still exists without him, right? Well, yeah, but sure. the problem with Kony, the problem yeah. that address wasn't, you know, peace in Central Africa, it was just Kony. And yeah. to, to, to be fair, in, they didn't capture him, but, but some of that did change a lot. Like, uh, maybe <coughs> so from, the, from the tactical perspective, part of the mm -hmm. having such a, like, a, a, a well-delimited target is probably a tactical mistake mm -hmm. because they could have, you know, maybe it served the purpose of getting people excited about a very specific thing, but much of the cause was driven for it. I have, I have many um, reserves about the campaign, but on that, I think, to be fair. Or you could argue that it was uh, a tactical mistake in terms of the population here, not seeing this goal achieved, right. but in terms of populations, in terms of the target populations, um, having a single pinpointed target for this population to, t to focus on and rally around and fund, and then using that funding to fund other more nuanced um, activities that have actually helped those populations out fine. So the only population that's really duped and feeling unfulfilled is the one here, um, which is fine. Like, as long as you don't have to appeal to them again. You know. <laughs> In terms of the strategy and tactics, the two areas that I'm, I didn't hear you talk about in terms of improvement, one is the mobilization logistics of material. Mm -hmm. um, there are real problems in fulfillment and yep. in movement of materials to especially the youth and young adult communities that yep. were so brilliantly activated and made aware. Yep. Second, the um, maybe missteps or learnings about sustaining mobilization and engagement of youth and young adult popula populations. I think there was a great deal of wishful thinking mm -hmm. about the degree of momentum and how that would carry out into execution at the street level. So I'm very curious to know, what's the organization learned or what have you mm -hmm. um, evaluated as some of the insights into maintaining uh, mobilization engagement? Because I think yeah. um, the reaction of the organization, and this is a statement, the reaction of the organization to the founders' breakdown, I thought was um, uh, rather immature. Uh, in terms of hiding out in shame, not being as aggressive, letting that be the story that carried, as mm -hmm. opposed to being more aggressive and countering the story. I thought it was a real disservice for su supposedly such a media-savvy organization not to be um, able to pivot itself more aggressively and, and appeal to the larger issues, and in some yeah. ways shame the press about making the kind of case it was making. So, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so three things you brought up there. The first, um, the, the logistical aspects and the fact that they did break down in fulfillment, they addressed that in MOVE. And this is, this is one of the main things that I've uh, noticed in, in looking into this campaign is that it, it blew up way too big for them 
way bigger than they expected it to, um, way bigger than anyone else expected it to. And so the main critiques of this campaign really are that it got too big. Um, if, if Invisible Children had, had managed to have 2,000 people buy action kits and go out into the streets and lobby Congress, everyone would have said, that's an amazing job that you got 2,000 people to care about the LRA. But because they got 100 million people to care, suddenly it's like, well, the LRA isn't important enough for 100 million people to care about anymore. You know? And you know, a lot of the, the, um, the fulfillment issue is the same thing. They weren't expecting that many people to order action kits. And so when they, when they failed on fulfillment, when their website crashed and they had to send people to their Tumblr instead, and then everyone thought they were a fake organization because they're an internet organization that doesn't have a website. Um, all of these things are failures of getting too big and being too successful. Um, and um, the same thing with not being able to pivot the Jason Russell mental breakdown. I think they, they were just so overwhelmed as a young, uh, a young both as an organization and as a group of people uh, organization they didn't know how to react so um, I don't I don't really know what the solution is to that except that they are probably now taking stock and learning and trying to you know strategize and plan their way forward and I think they're generally quite a savvy and smart organization they've learned now that they can scale that big and they probably will prepare for that kind of scale the next time they run a campaign uh, in terms of replicability for other organizations, I don't know if there's any way you can tell that you're going to make it that big until you do, and then until you um, buckle under the pressure of, of having gained that much exposure. Yeah, um, I actually first watched the Chronicles 2012 video uh, last night, and coming to the video with an awareness of the massive viral hit that it became, and mm -hmm. you've seen all of it links that my friends posted on Facebook um, last spring. It seemed to almost be a self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts and that video devotes so much of its run running time to like the power of the internet, and the power of social networking. Um, and I, I was curious if any other you know, um, groups like Invisible Children have attempted to kind of sensationalize like the power of mass media and the internet in the same way. I think part of the video's success was in that it made people excited about how like through the internet they could make sensationalizing um, I'm not aware of, of that many other organizations that have done it very successfully. I know there's, um, there's a really interesting YouTube fundraising um, project where um, two guys have gotten together and uh, YouTube is somehow affiliated and they crowdfund to they basically fundraise to give away money to one or two nonprofits, and they do that through having crowdsourcing video um, fundraising videos. Uh, so it's crowd crowd based in several aspects. It's YouTube affiliated, um, but it's kind of hard to understand. I mean, it's, it's really hard for me to explain, and so maybe that's where it falls. Um, but I haven't really come across any that have been as successful as Invisible Children. Amnesty International has some very good campaign videos, but I think their most viewed video is under 10,000 views still. Um, I wanted to touch upon uh, two things. Uh, so transparency and like, credibility and how they link together. So you mentioned before that um, they had their, their four areas, what they were, mm -hmm. they were good at, and one of them was media and the other was mobilization. And uh, you said it, it would be better if they were upfront about saying this is what we're good at, um, and along with creating those other other gateways that, uh, you know, the drillability that uh, mm -hmm. you know, Ethan Zuckerman and other people talk about. Um, but I'm also wondering uh, just how that, if, if that would have, if being more transparent would have, would have, uh, eased a little the issue of what happened with, with Russell's breakdown. And then uh, another thing, um, I'm not sure how much this uh, affected uh, the credibility of their organization, but then like the leaked cables, 
about uh, involvement with uh, government agencies and uh, collaboration with uh, to get the military intervention in, in, in uh, you know in Uganda and these countries. I'm just wondering, you know, uh, it seems to be that there's a, ca a careful balance there where. Uh, on the one hand, transparency uh, probably would help it, but then on the other hand, you did have a lot of these, well, mainly the, the break, Brussels breakdown, but then further down the line when there was more investigation of the organization, mm -hmm. things like the leaked cables uh, that, that really um, came down hard on the organization. So I'm just wondering what, what, what's your assessment of, of how organizations can learn from that? Or, um, it, it's hard. You, you can never be completely transparent as an organization. One, because people don't want to know all of that information until a scandal happens and then they want to dig it up. Um, and, and two, it's not appropriate to reveal. I, I, I don't think any organization is completely transparent about everything um, that goes on. Um, but one thing they did attempt to do, which I think was the right thing to do, is to once people started trying to dig into their their finances and their background, is to be as transparent on those issues as they could. Um, and I think that's all any any non nonprofit or anyone uh, having someone delve into your closet is just be like, well, here it is. Um, but no, I don't think upfront complete transparency is appropriate for nonprofits. question mark at the end of it. Um, but I remember when I was in high school, which was a little while ago, Invisible Children came to my high school and did show a presentation, you know, sort of resembled 2012 in a lot of the sort of media mm -hmm. use and a lot of the sort of action items that were bracelets. And I would like to push back based on that a little bit on your sort of like, oh, it doesn't matter that this we activated this broader set of people who gave money and now don't see anything coming out of their work. Because I think that that's the tactic that they used sort of when I remember being in high school. It was sort of an overly simplistic view of what was happening in Uganda. They got the same pushback then, um, like, you know, wait, I don't think this represents the, the whole story. I remember people asking their teachers about like, hey, so can we learn more about this, which is great but that invisible children sort of wasn't linking out, wasn't creating that. So, I mean, I guess that I, I'm a little skeptical about sort of like, oh, they're really good at media and mobilization and they should just focus on that because I think that what it does is it turns, um, you know, it turns people off sort of compassion fatigue style um, mm -hmm. on getting involved in these kind of projects because what they see is I, you know, I tried, I did these things, and nothing even came out of it at all. And, like, when I saw 2012 come out, I was like, oh, God, it's invisible children. Like, these people who came to my high school and nothing ever came of it. Um, so I guess it it's really hard for me to, like, hear. It's like, oh, it's great that we reached all these people and, oh, nothing happened. And that's totally fine. It was a successful campaign. I think it's better if you reach less people and actually activate them more fully and actually, you know, people gain more knowledge about what's going on and get a completer picture. Like, you know, quantity over quality over quantity is what we think. I, I agree, quality over quantity, but wouldn't it be great if we could get that quantity to quality? And we're halfway there with this campaign. That's, that's where I see the potential. How do you then link this ground surge with some actual follow through? Um, and I, I think Invisible Children gets us more there today in 2013 than they did 10 years ago when they were at your high school, or even a year ago when they released Coney 2012. If you look on their website today, there are a lot of link throughs to other reports and, and, and other agencies, a lot more than they used to have. Um, but there can be more. And I think other agencies should also reach out to invisible children and um, organizations like them and use them. So, you know, um, Human Rights Watch could use invisible children or work in, in conjunction with them to run a campaign together so that you've got experts on the context, on the ground, working with experts in media and communication, which is what I see Invisible Children as more than anything. Well, along the same lines, in your own work, 
you, you have all these lessons. Which one of them do you think could apply to musicians or, or other cases that are social justice oriented, but maybe smaller in scale, not exactly uh, humanitarian crisis issues? How, how do you, or what lessons have you taken that you'll apply yourself? Um, the lessons that I've taken, you probably won't like because they're the commercial and fundraising ones. And again, this comes down to the scale, right? So every nonprofit has merchandise. Every, every nonprofit wants to sell them. But as soon as you sell 500 million t-shirts, people, you know, people feel dirty about the fact that you're a nonprofit and you've done so well at t-shirt sales. Um, but <laughs> that's something I, I look to Invisible Children as a model for merchandising and um, and for small donation, raising donations and raising memberships from small scale values but last, large scale quantity. Um, and that's something they have been um, really good at. They haven't been good at sustaining interest and engagement on, on an intellectual level, but they've been really good at um, fundraising on this really large scale. So um, it seems to me that, that, um, that attention is, kind of, is a precursor to action. Mm -hmm. and, and so with, just within an attention economy framework, um, they, they've done a spectacular job uh, getting people to, to notice. And I wonder if there's a, a, just a different way of evaluating the success of campaigns um, as a, so that it's not about, if, if it was about removing Coney, um, that's not necessarily the, the mode to evaluate this campaign on. It's, it's simply a matter of opening up, opening up discourse. Mm -hmm. And to that, I think that it's really interesting to me that the video was, that was 30 minutes. And I don't, I, I don't know any of them. I know very few people who actually watched it, right? So it was, um, and there, so there is this meta text that was built around mm -hmm. the video. And, and I think that's really important to think about the video and all of the meanings of that video and how it kind of manifests itself within social media in one sort or another um, outside of, and the narrative becomes assumed and related as opposed to yeah. actually consumed. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. And also the, the subsequent discussions that evolved out of it um, by and between people who may or may not have watched the video either but are relying on this, this you know, um, sort of narrative that's been perpetrated by uh, or propagated by uh, by the news media and by blogs and, and, and now a little bit academic articles. There still aren't that many academic articles on the on the issue or the campaign. But the discourse that followed the video is almost um, can stand on its on its own almost as something to to evaluate and, and to um, to dig into because it, it, it generated a very rich discourse in its wake, beginning days after uh, most of the articles and, and blogs on Coney 2012 came out in the week after the video came out. And there's, there's not that much afterwards. The academic articles came out a month or two after that. Um, but I think that the conversation should continue and the analysis should continue. There's a lot to unpack um, that hasn't yet been unpacked. To me, that the important point here is not that those people elicited emotional reactions uh, through their video, if uh, per se, but the important question is how do you channel that energy afterwards to get people to act upon it in a useful way. Um, and so I wonder whether and who were the critics who attacked that video on the emotional incitation angle as like, there seems to be a sense in which everybody expects a commercial to be entertaining, fun, eliciting emotional reactions, right? But as long as like you come to a serious subject, the only way to enter it would be through information overload and boredom. So, which seems to me like a very bad strategy to like get people's interest. If you look at any good lecture, academic lecture, that's what people do, right? They they attract, they catch you up, they attract you with some kind of picture or something. Then they give you a frame that's totally like elusive about what they're going to say, and then they dig in once you're with them. Yeah. 
So it's a very bad understanding of what like this whole is. So were there really people who were like upset with the fact that this elicited emotions per se? And I'm also interested in like who were those critics more generally and what was their stake in that particular mm -hmm. issue for them to step in? Yeah, th there was a lot of criticism on the emotional aspect, more on the fact that it was emotions that weren't backed up by thought. Uh, so emotions that would lead to action that that was based on not enough context, basically. Uh, and those reactions were from academics, of course. Uh, <laughs> which were probably which, bad at doing those things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there was uh, the anti-commercialization reaction was also mostly an academic one. Um, and, and I guess from... When I say academic, it's, it's often practitioners who are also researching and writing on the issues. So uh, practitioners in the nonprofit human rights field. So we working in this field have, we walk this line of needing funding and needing to reach out beyond grant funding to other sources, but feeling dirty about purely commercial sources like merchandising. Uh, and I think that critique came from that. Um, it wasn't so much about invisible children as it was about our, our own shame <laughs> at this this way of fundraising. One more question. Uh, I saw uh, online somewhere a campaign that it was about uh, getting pop stars recording coming home songs. Mm -hmm. And I guess the idea is that uh, there are now all these kids out there who are involved in this stuff, and they're horribly embarrassed or have various psychological issues about what they've done, and they're afraid to come home. And uh, there were local indigenous songs that, that got recorded and get broadcast to try and encourage the kids to go home, and this, is, this has been effective. And I'm curious if Invisible Children is involved with that, or if that's a separate thing. And, and I wonder the extent to which this as a, as a template might is, is what you might do moving forward. So for instance, you might say, as, as was observed, uh, well, look, uh, look, with the great efforts of lots of people and many forces, uh, Kony is now marginalized. But, but now you have to deal with uh, the reality of a place that has been scarred by, by these mm -hmm. decades. And this would uh, sort of enable one to say, OK, something has happened. But now what are the set of things you have to do to deal with reality? And also it might allow the tying in of the personal narrative of, of you have a place that's psychologically scarred, that had a breakdown, and it has to recover. And this is, you know, might, might help to tie a bunch of things together. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be a really good place for, for invisible children to move into. So move away from targeting Kony per se and more towards rehabilitation and healing. Um, the Coming Home campaign, I believe, was a UN-sponsored campaign, and the UN uh, subbed out a lot of the aspects of it to different organizations. So I know Invisible Children did the flyers. They made flyers uh, for this campaign and would airdrop them across uh, vast expanses of jungle where Kony and his army were believed to be. Um, and they've had some success with people coming back to their communities holding these flyers and saying this is the reason I came home. They also, um, from, from the radio stations that they've built, broadcast come, coming home messaging. So um, they've been very involved in that aspect of it. I'll yeah. <laughs> well, they, have, um, they just started a rehabilitation program in the DRC. Um, that just opened up last month. And they also do um, focus a lot of their um, on-the-ground initiatives on education, like schools, not only um, elementary schools, but also high schools, and then sending um, uh, children in the region on to college. And then also on, um, like you kind of touched on this a little, like uh, sustainable, fair trade, uh, like economic growth for the area so that they have something to go back to. Right, I think. Yeah. Thank you.